Good evening, everybody. I hope you're all well. And welcome to Oh My Lords. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm delighted to welcome our distinguished guests, Lord Pollock and Lord Livingston, who are both members of Borough and Elstree Synagogue, and welcome them together with their families who are joining us this evening as well. Just a brief introduction, and then we'll begin our conversation. But before we do, I say, please, again, this is meant to be a a group conversation, so please join in by posting your questions in the chat facility or raising your hand at the end as well. Uh, we're both uh, live here on uh, Zoom and on Facebook as well, so you can ask your questions in both, preferably in the chat facility here on Zoom. So as I said, I'm delighted to welcome um, our Lords this evening. Firstly, Lord Livingston, Lord Livingston of Parkhead, who is a Conservative peer who has sat under the title in the Lords since 2013. He was Minister of State, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, Trade and Investment from 2013 to 2015. He was born in Scotland, and after graduating with an economics degree from the University of Manchester, he trained as an accountant with Arthur Anderson, then moved to the Bank of America, and then the private equity firm 3i. He moved to Dixon's Group in 1991 before becoming the youngest FTSE 100 Finance Director at the age of 32 and in 2008 became Group CEO of BT Group. He's also a non-executive director of Celtic FC. Lord Livingston, welcome. Uh, Lord Pollock, Baron Pollock, CBE of Hartsmith, was born in Liverpool and led the services at Childwell Hebrew Congregation for educational trips to Israel from the age of 15. He went on to become a youth officer at the Edgeway United Synagogue and served as an officer of the Board of Deputies of British Jews in the 1980s. He served as the director of the Conservative Friends of Israel for, for 26 years and is now president of the Conservative Friends of Israel. He's also a trustee of the Holocaust Memorial Trust, an avid Liverpool supporter. So we have to start by wishing him Mazatov on them winning the premiership. Thank Lord, you. Welcome and thank you for joining us. So we'll start with a, a first question, really. And, and um, Lord, if you don't mind, I'll start with Lord Pollock. Well, Pollock, firstly, thank you for joining us. And firstly, can you tell us how, how have you and your family been managing during lockdown? Um, well, uh, thank you. Thank you for, for inviting us. Um, we've actually done re remarkably quite well. Uh, unfortunately, Charlotte was, was ill at the beginning. So our lockdown started a, a week before everybody else's because she had the uh, symptoms. And so we were self-isolating. But you know, it's, it's been remarkable. I, I, I'm sort of a person who likes to just be out and be with people and I didn't know how I, I would actually survive uh, one day, let alone three months. Um, but I don't know what it's like for everybody. Uh, you know, for us, it's, it's something like, before you turn around, Shab Shabbat is here. Um, the, the days are going remarkably quickly. Uh, I've been busy in, uh, with, with business and work and, 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 and politics. Um, but yeah, we, we, we've managed in the early days, the kids would come from uh, Hendon and uh, Finchley to drop food by because we weren't going out. Um, but yeah, we, we've survived. Um, the hardest part was for the first few, few weeks, there was no live sport at all. Uh, but of course, uh, as you rightly said a, a moment ago, Rabbi, uh, we've made up for that uh, big time. Good, I'm sure that, that helps you. Thank you, I'm you all well now. Uh, Lord Livingston. Uh, and no problem at all starting with Stuart. It's always good to, I think the older people should have respect and go first. Uh, the um, uh, uh, look, lockdown's been, been pretty straightforward. Uh, we've been uh, all been well for a start, which is great. But I think it's, you know, uh, we're very fortunate uh, if you have uh, some space and uh, uh, and and the garden, you can and you can walk outside it. You're very fortunate. Uh, it's been taken up. It's been remarkably busy. I think all of us have not only discovered Zoom, but discovered just how more tiring it is speaking to people virtually than in real life. Uh, but you know, the this has been a lot more distressing if you're uh, a family with two kids who aren't at school and you live in a flat and you've got you know one computer between you if that yeah that's the people I, you know one has to feel really sorry i think uh, we've been very fortunate and uh, and it's uh, and it's and it's gone well and as, as Stuart said it's, it's raced by really in many ways it's uh, i think as someone who said you at the start of it we'd be here three months later uh, talking about this um we'd all been a bit surprised but uh, it's been uh, not too bad. Sure, great, thank you. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the age difference between the two of you. I didn't want to mention it. No. <laughs> Can you tell us how, 
what, what has it been like in the House of Lords during lockdown? Well, the, the House of Lords has been, uh, I mean, if you want to define a group that needs to be shielded um, in terms of the average age in the House of Lords is about 70. So um, uh, uh, people genuinely and rightly uh, didn't come into the House of Lords and the House of Lords had adopted a, a far more sensible approach than I think the Commons was doing. Uh, and we've been uh, uh, voting remotely. Uh, and uh, uh, that's been a challenge, I think, for some of uh, uh, the noble lords and their experience of technology. Uh, but uh, it's, been, it's, it's actually been done very well. We've been involved in uh, uh, select committees, debates, questions, and it's been, uh, it's been done remotely and the workings of Parliament are going on. I mean, it doesn't substitute for seeing people in person, but uh, a few people uh, are going into Lords at any given time, but uh, uh, the vast majority are doing it remotely and are voting. I think there was three or four votes last week and uh, over 500 people participated. Wow. I think a lot of people would be surprised that there's even Wi-Fi in, in the House of Lords, so it's good to hear. Uh, it's not good. <laughs> I, I, I did something that I, 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 I'd never done before uh, last week, which was uh, I, I voted from the 17th green because I was playing golf and the, 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 the uh, phone went and said there was a, a debate on and we had to vote. But I think um, the, uh, Ian's right. The, the, the House of Lords, has, we're, we're in a hybrid. So some people go in, very few, uh, and some people go, uh, work from from home and do it on Zoom. Uh, when I know I'm speaking, because you have to put your name down and then you, only 10 people can be brought in in a, in a particular question uh, and you're told the day before. So if you're in the top 10, you're, you're gonna speak. Um, so for instance, tomorrow I, I'm, I, I've got some other stuff, so I will be in tomorrow. I'm, I'm speaking on a, a question to do with um, domestic violence, actually. So I, I go in if I can to do it, partly because uh, you know, I have other things to go down to town for, um, but also it means actually getting out and, you know, you know for three months, not, not driving down the Fincher Road was really quite, quite, uh, quite great. It was very, <laughs> um, you know, bizarrely, the traffic last week was, was horrendous. Yeah, right. people, are, people are beginning to vote with their feet. Right. I saw somebody said that traffic's up 44% over the week before, something like that. Yeah. Now, now neither of you are Londoners. Um, Lord Pollock, can you tell me, to what extent does coming from Liverpool prepare you for a life in politics? Um, I was never intending to go into politics, um, um, to be honest. And I, I think what, what Liverpool prepares you for, being involved in a small community, I think Liverpool has always had a, um, an advantage over other communities, Jewish communities of its size, because of the, the, the schools, the primary and secondary school, the activities. There used to be a, a great community centre, which uh, uh, is not there, sadly, anymore. But uh, Liverpool uh, certainly prepared. And, you know, I was brought up in a family. My late father was involved in the community and in, uh, in the, running the, the shul and, uh, and so on. So you, 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 you learn to either get, in, you, to get involved, to, to play a part. Right. And I guess that was the... Um, the thing um, and in terms of getting involved in politics well as, as people know locally here I, I've never been on the board of management of the of the shul uh, I think I learned at a pretty young age uh, that you know if I wanted to get involved in politics in general um, that was going to be a lot easier than being involved in shul politics right very sensible <laughs> it sounds very sensible um, we'll move on swiftly um, <laughs> um, how, how did you get into politics? Yeah, like uh, Stuart, I had uh, no intent of going to politics, and certainly I share most of my family were involved in shoe politics as well, and that, that certainly kept me away from that side of things. Um, but I, I, was, I was a business person, and, uh, 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 and my involvement in politics was largely accidental. Um, I was sitting uh, at uh, next to uh, uh, Jeremy Hayward, uh, who sadly passed away recently, he was a cabinet secretary at a, a, an evening event. And he said to me, uh, I said, what are you going to do when you leave BT? And at that point, I was the CEO of BT. And I said, well, I'm not about to leave BT. I've been there six years. I've just got the sports rights. Everything's going really well. And he said, uh, he said have you ever thought of going to government? I said, no. Uh, the next day, he, he, gave me a he phoned me and said, will you see the prime minister? 
um, which is not one of those questions to which the answer is typically no. Mm -hmm. um, I put my outlook on, uh, on month view because he's a busy man and, and, uh, and Jeremy said uh, 4.30 tomorrow and I went in and David Cameron uh, was sitting there and he said, uh, he said there's something I'd like you to do. He said it's, it's unpaid, it's full time and I can only guarantee it to the next election. Um, <laughs> and then he said the worst seven words in the English language but it's really important for the country. And, um, and look, we all know, we all have the same background and, and what this country owes us. So I said, I wasn't a politician by background. Uh, and uh, I, I said, I said, um, but I did, I did admire David Cameron. So I said, uh, yes. And I went home that night and said to my wife, uh, uh, Debbie, uh, had an interesting meeting today. And that's how I became trade minister. So it wasn't through intent or involvement. And uh, uh, I moved from uh, business into, uh, into government. Wow. And are, how do you see the differences between the business world and the, and the political world? Uh, they're pretty substantial. Uh, one, of the, uh, well, one of the first things I noticed was technology. You mentioned earlier about Wi-Fi in the House of War Lords. Well, I mean, technology in the government was certainly a decade behind what I was used to, particularly as CEO of BT. And so uh, that was tricky. But more it's... Um, there's some great people. I want to say, you know, in the civil service in particular, and 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 the the cabinet at the time was some of the brightest people. I mean, whether William Haig or uh, uh, George Osborne, David Cameron, uh, Michael Gove were incredibly bright people. I mean, David Liddington, who was the Europe Minister, had won University Challenge twice. I mean, these, these were some of the brightest people we come across. So, you know, quality of people was there. But there was this so many people who could say no to things so getting things done was was tricky and also you're there's a, as a minister there's very few of the civil service you're allowed to appoint yourself which meant that you when you're in business the biggest thing uh in business is how to how to make change happen is by who you appoint and um uh, if you couldn't appoint your own people and for good reason because you don't want to politicize civil service uh, it does make it uh, tricky however to make change happen at the pace you would want to. So it's, it's more difficult, but it was, it was a superb honor, uh, you know, uh, being, a, uh, being a government minister and you know, whether it was doing the intro act for Merkel and Cameron or being the first minister to spend an hour with, with Modi of India or you know, the 40 odd countries I visited, it was a great honor, but, but really not in the plan that I had for life. Right, right. Um, and if a young person was to come to you today and say, I'm considering options in both in the business world and in the uh, political world, how, what would you say to them? I'd say start in the business world. I think one of the problems in politics is there's too many people who um, have only ever been in politics whose life has been defined by being a special advisor and then a candidate and they don't have enough knowledge of real life. So I'd say go into business first, learn something about the world, or, you know, whether it's going to professions, do something learn something about that. Also, you've got something to, to fall back on when you lose your seat, as you might well do, um, uh, but you'll also be a lot better, a lot better minister uh, or, or, or MP for having done something, for having uh, been exposed uh, around the world. So, um, you know, I would say start in business and then, and then if you still have the passion, uh, uh, go on. I mean, and I think that's one of the great things in Stuart, I'm sure would say in the House of Lords, there's so many people who come with, with a range of, of expertise rather than just being politicians. In fact, most of them are not politicians. Right, well, that's, that's great advice, thank you. Now, Lord Pollock, you also had an interesting route into politics as well. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I, again, as I said earlier on, it was sort of accidental, but um, having worked uh, in, in uh, Edgware as a youth worker, I, I, I left Liverpool when I was uh, 1984, and I, I came down to London for a job with the United Synagogue. In fact, at the time, there were two jobs going. There was one as a youth worker in Hendon, a place of which I'd heard of because my sister had just moved there six months earlier, and another place called Edgware, which I have to say I'd never heard of. And uh, I, I did say to the people at the United Synagogue, uh, you'll understand this, Rabbi, I said, will you please consider me for the Hendon job? So, of course, they gave me the Edgware job. And uh, I spent six months there. I, I enjoyed it immensely. Uh, I lived next door to the late Diane Lopian, who uh, watched over me, and uh, I, I worked closely with him, and he was uh, 
uh, somebody who I could turn to for advice in many times. And then, then I, I, I was uh, approached to become the education director of the Board of Deputies, which I did for uh, five years. And then, I, again, I was approached by a few businessmen. They said to me, um, we'd like you to run the Conservative Friends of Israel. Uh, this is back in 1989. And I, I remember replying and I said, well, that's great. I said, but I've never been to the House of, Houses of Parliament. I said, I, I'm really, you know, politics was not my my bag. Uh, my brother, who's I think on, on, on tonight, he was involved in the Young Conservatives in Liverpool. So if your older brother is involved with that as a teenager, you would do one of two things. You either join the Labour Party or, or, or you don't get involved in politics at all. And, and I chose the second and spent most of my time playing and watching sport. But then, um, I'd say, I was approached to, to do this back in 1989, and uh, uh, the nub of the activity was to educate the Conservative Party, whether it's candidates, um, ministers, members of parliament, councillors, about Israel. Uh, and so, you know, I, I've spent um, 25 years running it, building it up, um, probably led about 150 trips of uh, MPs and others to Israel and it's not just what you sort of when you take and see it's the it's the shared experience you have with these people and uh, Ian mentioned people like George Osborne and uh, and others you know my, my most iconic trip was in 2004 which I'll talk about later if, if people are interested but that was with a guy called George Osborne who people didn't know much at the time uh, in 2004 uh, and another guy who people had heard of, he was the, the shadow minister for culture at the time, his name was Boris Johnson. And we had the most amazing visit to Israel for all sorts of reasons. So I, I got involved in politics that way. And then in, the, in 2015, when it seems like a, a, an age ago, when, the, uh, we, when David Cameron won the election in 2015, a couple of weeks afterwards, uh, I, I got a phone call similar to how Ian was describing, but I got a phone call at home on a Sunday morning and the uh, it was on my mobile and it said uh, unknown number so uh, having been to the gym and about to watch a cricket game uh, I ignored it because I thought it would only be the press or somebody whatever so I, I ignored it then two minutes later the, the mobile rang again and I, I answered and the, 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 the voice at the other end of the phone said, um, is that Stuart Pollock? I said, yes. They said, well, will you, will you hold the line for the Prime Minister? This is Downing Street, so switchboard, will you hold the line for the Prime Minister? Now, of course, I knew the Prime Minister, David Cameron, at the time, and I'd been involved in some speech writing and others for him. Um, but he did used to ring me on a Sunday morning, I can promise you. And then during that conversation, he, he, he asked, uh, he said, his actual words were, he said, um, I'm making a list of, of peers. You know, I, I, I didn't get to the levels of, of Ian, who went straight to become a minister. I'm the, the backbencher. And he, he said to me, uh, I'm making a list of people to go into the House of Lords as working peers. And he said, I'd be delighted if you would uh, agree to be on the list. So I'm sitting there and I go, OK. Uh, well, I said, I'd, I'll be delighted. And he said... I'm delighted you're delighted. And the conversation ended, the last line of the conversation, and this is the reason I, I, I was put into the House of Lords by David Cameron and, and George Osborne. He, his last line to me was, and when you're in the House, David Cameron, a prime minister at the time, said, I, I expect you to counteract the pro-Palestinians on the Labour benches. He was basically saying that you've done all this work for Israel, and now just raising you just a little bit, carry on and do the work. So that's how I got involved. Wow. Thank you. That's an incredible, incredible story. As you mentioned, uh, you've been working for the Conservative Friends of Israel for a number of years now. And I think we, everyone can say that the tremendous contribution you've made to Anglo-Israeli relations and the community owes you a huge debt of gratitude for that. And you mentioned you've made over 150 trips taking um, various different ministers and politicians to Israel. Uh, can, you, can you pick out a highlight or the most memorable trip you ever made? Yeah, I mean, I alluded it to, to it before. This was the 2000, November 2004 trip. Uh, it consisted of uh, George Osborne, who was uh, a new, he'd been an MP for a couple of years. Uh, Boris Johnson, who was the shadow minister for culture. 
uh, this guy called Mark Francois, who's a, a, um, an Essex member of parliament, he's still a member of parliament, and Theresa Villiers, some will know her, she's the local MP in Barnet. Uh, she just been, she just finished being a member of the European Parliament. And uh, yeah, it was four of us uh, and me. The, 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 the nub of the story was this, uh, two things really uh, that stand out. One was that Boris had been to Israel before. Uh, he'd worked on a kibbutz as a youngster and stuff, but George Osborne, this was his first trip to Israel. And uh, we went on a Sunday, uh, but Boris was not coming till the Monday. He had a speech he was giving on the Sunday night. And so he was joining us on, on the Monday. And, uh, and um, the first morning on that Monday morning, when we were with the rest of the group, we went, we were in Herzliya having a discussion with um, Boaz Ganor on counterterrorism. He's the professor expert on counterterrorism. And I got a phone call on my uh, mobile phone. And that I was told that there would have been a suicide bomb at, at the Carmel Market. People will remember it. And I came back in and I didn't know really what I was doing, but I just said to the guys, you know what, let's um, finish this academic discussion about, uh, about counterterrorism. Let's go to the Carmel Market. And we went to the Carmel Market probably an hour, an hour and a half after the bomb which I think killed three people I can't remember exactly and this was the first morning for somebody like George Osborne on his trip to Israel we were in the Karma market and everybody on the uh, listening knows it well you know if he was with us now he, he'd remember the two stalls either side of the burnt out stall were carrying on selling the Zaka people were sadly picking up body parts, small parts. And we were there with the BBC, I remember there with the cameras and so on. And that was George Osborne's first experience, first morning uh, of Israel. And then we left there and it was really, really emotional, very difficult. We were left there. And then I got another phone call. And the other phone call was um, later that afternoon. I, as I said earlier, that, that Boris Johnson was coming later the day after. So I got a phone call on my mobile this time. They said, is that Stuart Pollock? I said, yes. They said, well, this is El Al security at Heathrow. Right. So I said, oh, hello. They said, do you know where Mr. Johnson is? So I, said, I looked at the time. I said, well, he should be on the plane with everybody else. He said, everybody else is on the plane, but Mr. Johnson is not. Um, but he has checked in. So I said, okay, look, give me your number. I'll ring you back in two minutes. And I, I rang Boris on his mobile. And I said, Boris, where are you? And he goes, oh, Stuart. So he said, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Heathrow. I said, well, that's very good. I said, but where? He said, well, I'm in Smith's looking at the books. I said, but everybody else is on the plane. <laughs> They're waiting for you to fly off. And Boris arrived that night. And you remember, he was a journalist, really. And he was there with his in his jacket with his notepad in his packet in his, in his in his jacket pocket and he said uh, as we he arrived that evening and he said so what have i missed and i said to him everything and we explained what we'd done and the next day boris we went back to the carmel market and it was a 16 year old kid who had blown himself up and boris said i remember he said i, I need to try and understand what is driving a 16 year old kid to do this he said i'm gonna i'm gonna use my press pass and i want to go and see his parents They're somewhere near ramallah so i said look well good luck boris but you can go off with pleasure you won't get within a, a mile of their house but you've got to be back four o'clock uh, this afternoon when we're meeting the uh, british ambassador or whatever we were doing and he came back and of course didn't see it and then we had the rest of the trip and the rest of the trip was something uh, remarkable because of the highs and lows and you know the, the the israelis on the on the thursday night one you know said this is the this is the the minister for culture they didn't understand the, the whole notion of shadow so i said well boris will get away with it just call him minister and uh, and that night on the thursday night we met with a guy called uh, who wasn't involved in politics his name was uh, yair lapid and Yair Lapid, we used to have the program on television. And that night, we, I, I've got some fabulous photos of cigars and uh, beer. But what happened there, and, and, and I'll, I'll finish with this, is that the, the relationships that are built, two things. One, 
Yair Lapid later became, after the 2010 election in Israel, the finance minister, and George Osborne was the chancellor. Yeah. During that period, there was, I remember, a particular issue that was to do, a very complicated issue, to do with VAT between the two countries. The civil servants were struggling to deal with it. And uh, I remember the Israel ambassador at the time said to me, you know, do you think we could try and, you know, get this thing sorted? So I, I just did a WhatsApp group with, with George and Yair, told them the issue, it was dealt with in a week. So it's those sort of relationships that you build on those things, on those trips that can use. And the final point, the second point was with Boris. When Boris was mayor of London, uh, I don't know if you will recall uh, that there was a spate of um, Palest pro-Palestinian posters put up all over the tube one night, the tube trains across London. And Yair Lapid was one who raised it all in, in uh, Israel amongst everybody else. But um, he, Yair called me and said, well, you know, I've got, I'm friendly with Boris. We haven't seen him for a while, but he's the, he's the mayor of London. He can sort this out. And the two of them got on the phone and, uh, and sorted out. So it's those relationships on these trips which are key. So uh, 2004, November 2004 is one particular that I will always remember. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much. Uh, um, I saw Lord Livingston, you were smiling right at one point during that story. Um, I, I was there to ask whether you've been on one of uh, Lord Pollock's trips. Uh, I haven't, but I have been with uh, both Gordon Brown and uh, separately with David Cameron. And uh, 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 there, there was a couple of visitors where I went on a trade mission with uh, uh, with Gordon Brown when he was Prime Minister and uh, it was a somewhat unfortunate event when uh, we, got, we went to the West Bank and we got stopped by a checkpoint and uh, it was, the Prime Minister wasn't with us but it was a, it was a UK trade mission. We got stopped uh, at a checkpoint and we were told we couldn't come any further and we said why not? They said it's closed, we're keeping it, the road free for a very important British trade mission um, <laughs> which is slightly unfortunate but the, I went, when I went with David Cameron um, we went, uh, uh, and David, uh, PM at the time, uh, spoke at the Knesset, and it was the day where the uh, the law that was going to um, force the Haredim into the army was coming through. So it was a bit of a bit of a tense time, and uh, and sure enough, uh, there was, as you would expect, the um, um, shouting and uh, problems, and nobody was keeping quiet. And they eventually, they eventually, um, when. The prime minister. So when when the when the, uh, Netanyahu spoke, uh, there was huge amounts of noise. When the when uh, uh, the opposition spoke, when the speaker spoke, it was pandemonium. David Cameron got up to speak, and and the place went quiet. This place went quiet for one thing. I remember when you're in Parliament that you normally turn your phone off, uh, but not in Israeli Parliament. Yeah. And uh, the phone rang, and uh, 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 of a of a Shas member of parliament and it's bad enough that your phone rings when the prime minister in other countries addressing you it's even worse if you don't switch it off it's even even worse when you answer the call and have a conversation um and i thought you're only in israel but david cameron said at the time he said um, he said before i came i said i was told there might be i, I said i want a quiet time away from pmqs this is a wednesday he said i thought i'd have a quiet time away from pmqs and uh, he said i was told that there'd be shouting i'd be told that there there might be expulsions i was told there might be fighting and i said i don't understand and he said i spent the last two hours here and as they say around here and uh, and and the place the place was really quiet and then david cameron said and he was saying next to the time he said i've uh, he said he, he said one of the greatest honors as a prime minister uh, has been to talk to Holocaust survivors and hear their story. And he told the story, and you'll all know about uh, a Polish uh, person who became a weightlifter, uh, etc. And Ben Helfcott was sitting next to me, and he said, and he told the whole story, Ben's whole story, and he said, and that weightlifter who uh, became a medalist for the UK is, is watching today, and it's Ben Helfgott, and the whole of the Knesset that had been arguing, shouting each other, all as one, stood up and turned round and gave him a standing ovation. And it was uh, it was a remarkably emotive time. So uh, I guess that's a slightly. So I wasn't one of Stuart's trips, but uh, I guess I've done one or two as, uh, uh, of my own. Right. 
Thank you. Did you see uh, both of the questions, but both of you really, uh, in terms of similarities and differences between Israeli politics and British politics? Um, I, I, I fear British politics is getting more like Israeli politics in terms of uh, uh, the extremes are moving further out. Um, but I think I think proportional representation does make it very different, very different uh, um, experience. I mean, Stuart will know uh, Israeli politics uh, uh, better than I. But uh, they, um, uh, I think, what was deemed to be set conventions in both countries um now no longer are you know people are breaking them and and in the old days in both countries it used to be if you did something wrong you sort of said sorry or you explained it or whatever today everyone just seems to be on the attack and uh i i you know my personal view is in both countries we could do with uh finding this finding the center and finding agreement rather than uh uh than, uh, than things splintering in, in more and more into extremes. But uh, I guess Stuart may have a marginally different view from that. Okay. Well, well, first of all, I, I mean, uh, it's interesting to listen to Ian's story. I, I, I too was on that trip with the Prime Minister. And in fact, I'd spent weeks uh, writing the speech with the speechwriter in, uh, in Downing Street for yeah, I that. Knew, I knew his retreat his, his, his wasn't that good. Uh, yeah, well, the, uh, yeah, I, I, I got into the, the Akshav bit, he, he, we practiced a bit. Um, it, was a, it was a fascinating, uh, a fascinating event, a fascinating story, and Ian describes it uh, absolutely brilliantly. He, in fact, he, the, the uh, Prime Minister also, near the beginning, because well, the way Ian described it was right, but, but what happened was you, know, you had some of the, the Shas people walked out while Netanyahu spoke and others walked out and you know I was sitting there with another group of members of parliament who had come on, on the trip and I was you know trying to he said well why are they walking out those religious ones I said well they're you know it's the afternoon mate I said maybe they're doing the afternoon service I mean I couldn't explain to them really what was actually what was actually happening and I think David Cameron and I didn't write this somebody was I, I think the British British ambassador uh, Matthew Gould was near him at the time and he turned around and said this, this is amazing I didn't expect it to be such a balagan uh, which Cameron again used but that speech was really important because it was a culmination of 20 odd years that I'd worked on the stuff on the stuff from the Israel uh, UK relations and uh, that speech went down very well a lot of a lot of visiting Prime Ministers go to the Knesset and, and sort of lecture and the idea was that David Cameron didn't want to do that he wanted to talk about a vision of what could be what but not lecturing people who you know are dealing with these things and he comes one this was his second visit I took uh, Cameron David Cameron on his first visit in 2006 um, and I'll never forget that too because we we took him on a plane from uh, Jerusalem up to the north and I remember David Cameron looking out of the windows and realizing and he said you know look you, you look left you see the Mediterranean and you look right if you've got some binoculars you'll see the River Jordan um, and he said and you, and you see the red roofs and it's all intertwined and he said you know if, without having done this I would not have really understood um, so we did that in 2006 and as, and as Ian said in 2000 and uh, 14 he, he, he did the the trip which was actually called off at one point I don't know if you recall in that period there was some flooding in uh, in the UK and he was due to go to the Knesset but it was called off and then uh, it was put back on again for a couple of weeks later um, but then there was a meeting I remember in number 10 and they were talking about well there's a problem well, I said, well what's the problem well the problem is that the Israeli foreign ministry have gone on strike and uh, they were discussing, well, you know, some, I think David Cameron actually asked, well, what does the Israeli foreign ministry do for the visit? So somebody said, well, they, they, they clear the roads, they have the outriders. He, I remember David Cameron turned around and said, well, I said, e e even I could find my way from Ben Gurion Airport to Jerusalem, he said. I don't need any foreign ministry. And so the, mini the, 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 uh, the trip went ahead and it was a... Uh, a, a great success. Great success. Great, thank you. Um, now, obviously, um, as the UK and around the world start to emerge from, from the coronavirus pandemic, from post-COVID, um, I'll ask you both, really, 
And obviously, I'm not going to ask you to comment on the British government's um, uh, policy during this time at all. But I'd ask you, do you think we'll see significant change in British society post-COVID? Lord maybe you want to go first. Uh, I think I think there will be uh, changes, I and mean, I think maybe split into two areas in particular. I mean, there will be changes in a lot of things. Uh, I mean, look, first of all, the economic. There's no question this has done serious damage, and whilst there is a there will be a recovery, and I think, uh, and whilst the Chancellor has done absolutely everything he possibly could do, we're going to see an impact, and the impact will be on unemployment, and uh, and you know, we'll have a We will be in a recession, and it will. Uh, and there'll be a big cost associated with it. So there's going to be a real economic cost, there's going to be real lives and real jobs, and, uh, and I think particularly will hurt uh, social mobility and, and inequality. I mean, what we've seen, you know, if you're in a private school or you've got uh, multiple computers at home, it's been a very different experience, for instance, for education that has been, um, if you're, uh, 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 if you've only got one computer or maybe none or no access to internet, so for a start, we're going to see a big economic effect, and uh, and that's going to be be difficult with much higher public sector debt to deal with. And the other thing I think is a big technological change. Um, I think it's forced a lot of change, whether it be exactly what we're doing now, and this is something that might have taken 10, 15 years to happen, and that's going to um, change how people consume educate uh, consume entertainment or educate and communicate with each other it won't replace it but it will give more alternatives and i think therefore you'll see less people coming into the office as often as they do you'll see maybe people traveling uh, less to do business meetings because it'll be more accepted and i've just had so many meetings with people from the u.s i was meant to be in the u.s two or three times in the course of the last uh, number of months and other places and uh, and, uh, and people have been very happy. So there'll be a big technological change that will drive a change in behavior. Um, uh, it's not that everything will stay as it is just now. Some of it will revert and there'll be a mix, but I think people have become a lot more used to doing things in a remote way. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, some of it will be good change. Um, and some of it I think will be very, very difficult for uh, uh, for people to handle, and that of course rather depends on whether we see another another wave coming through. Um, I think the changes we might make just now, particularly economically, uh, will be of a certain nature. But if we have another very major wave, it will be uh, a lot more difficult to handle. Right. Thank you. I mean, look, we, as you said, we we definitely seen as a community the possibilities that technology have allowed us to engage with people who in a physical way may never have actually been engaged with us so yes it's something we probably will be retaining in some way as we go forward uh, lord pollock yeah i mean I, I was thinking back to some of the big events amongst the sort of jewish community so yom Ha'atzmaut, for instance which is always a, a big event and people get get involved but i and i normally go to kinloss and there's a thousand people and somebody from the government the chief rabbi the israel ambassador but you know what because of the way it had to be done this year via technology, it actually reached many more people than the thousand people who would turn up uh, at Kinloss. So while there's going to be a mix, and I agree with Ian on that, and I think going forward, I think from a business point of view, and I, I do some, some business, I think um, the one area which will be tougher, and certainly the business stuff that I'm involved in, is, is, is going about and creating new business. Because new business is generally done through personal connection or meetings or seeing the body language and so on. So in, in the insurance world, which I, I, I do a little bit of, um, you know, keep, keeping the, 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 the regular business or the business you have and the renewals, you will keep generally as long as you're pretty sensible about it because people will be, will be thinking twice about having uh, sort of moving and, and so the new business element will be difficult the other aspect of the economy and stuff i mean yeah i mean look the the the, the amount of money that's been plowed into uh, rightly so i mean you know the furlough scheme that the, uh, the government put into place i think was the most generous in the world was was the right thing to do to try and keep things going but of course the test will be uh, over the coming months as things start hopefully going back to some normality the problem is paying this back and the problem is getting the economy the economy working and often it's done through exports and, and so on and so forth but you know 
it's the same thing has happened around the world. So how, how are we going to get out of all this? It would take a long, a long time. I hope we do. I, I, and uh, I, I think that, um, you know, the government, government had a, a real problem. And the bottom line is there was no textbook to hold this whole thing. There was no textbook to follow. And because we're, 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 we're doing this from the, the shul group, I was talking to some other, other lords um, uh, in the house a, a week or two ago. And we were talking about, you know, should they have locked down faster? Should they have done this? I said, but, you know, you take your, your scientific or your, your, your uh, me medical advice, you take your advisors, and, and you, you follow you to like in a, in a business deal, you take your legal advice to, to cover yourself. And I explained it like this to them. Um, and I said, it's like a page of Gemara. I said, it's the Talmud. Because it's um, at the top of the page, I was explaining to them, you'd have one rabbi who would say X, Y, Z. I said, and the rest of the page is 27 other rabbis telling them while the first guy was wrong. I said, and, and, and that's the same a little bit with medical advice and who do you take from? So there's been no textbook to follow. It has been very difficult. But I would say this, I think come the time, uh, whenever it is in a year or two, uh, and it looks at this moment that, that we in Britain have, uh, uh, it looks like we've had a lot of deaths and not, not more sadly than other countries. I think we here continue to play cricket by the rules. And, and report the, the numbers. And I think we'll find eventually that it, we're not going to be very different from any other country who seem at the moment to be better than us. Interesting. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that. Now, obviously, apart from um, the coronavirus pandemic in, in the headlines, uh, this week again, anti-Semitism was in the headlines with the sacking of Rebecca Long-Bailey. Um, can I ask you both, um, how do you assess anti-Semitism currently in the Labour Party and uh, the new leaders approach to it and also more personally have you ever experienced anti-Semitism in either your professional or your political lives? You go first. I'll let, I'll, I'll let the younger better looking one go first. Okay well on that, with that intro um, uh, I, I mean look, I think uh, uh, Keir Starmer to be fair is, is, is walking the walk. I mean the there is a genuine failure to understand among uh, uh, the hard left, uh, I think, uh, what anti-Semitism is and, uh, and how uh, saying that the Jewish state is effectively responsible for all ills in the world is, is clear anti-Semitism. And I think at least, uh, I think Keir Starmer is genuine. The trouble is there's still so much to clear up. I mean, we also saw a tweet today from uh, BLM UK uh, which uh, uh, you know basically implied you can't be a Zionist and, and be in support of Black Lives Matter. So it is a, a challenge. I mean, his, uh, you know, just taking from a uh, my own uh, 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 personal background. You know, I come from Glasgow. And one of the things of Glasgow is is it's a strange city um, that uh, a bit like Belfast, I think, where uh, the issue is never are you Jewish. It tends to be, or uh, historically, it was are you Catholic or are you Protestant and you went to a different school and at being asked in Glasgow what school you went to was a bit like being asked in other parts of the world you know, how many generations have your family been here for um, it defined what religion you were and uh, so uh, growing up in Glasgow it was uh, it was it was uh, uh, you really didn't experience anything apart from very very casual anti-semitism I did however um, experience later on uh, um, uh, uh, some of the hard left Republican, uh, in all senses of the word, uh, movements, and it was sort of just there was a sort of presage of Corbyn. They weren't in Labour at the time; these people, but I think they joined it. Who did very much uh, see the, this combination, particularly of being a conservative peer and um, uh, and Israel, etc., in, in basically putting you as the imperialist aggressor, and the anti-Semitism uh, definitely flowed from that. Uh, I do recall in a slightly more light-hearted way that uh, when I when I was uh, made um, CEO of BT, uh, the um, I got a call from the uh, from the Scotsman newspaper, and this is a question you can only get in uh, in uh, from Scotland, and they said um, we've got a question for you. You went to they said uh, you're on the board of Celtic Football Club, well known as a Catholic football club uh, of least Catholic origin. I uh, said uh, you went to a proddy school, a Protestant school. And you claim to be Jewish. Uh, the guys in the press office, they think you're confused. 
<laughs> so Glasgow was a wee bit different, but I, I would say apart from kind of casual and saying there's only one real experience of of hardcore attack on you know on Twitter and other social media uh, that I experienced. Of course, what people say behind your back, uh, one doesn't know. But uh, for the very very most part, I found uh, uh, the UK and my business experience to be uh, very welcoming and opening to Jewish people and even Scottish Jewish people. <laughs> And that's all about being confused. It reminds me of, um, I remember there was, a, there was an article in the paper a few months ago about that there was an investigation in, into the Scottish prisons because they, they realised the number of uh, prisoners were, were, were claiming to be Jewish and they realised it was a scam in order to get the kosher food. It was better than the regular prison food. <laughs> so on, on, on the issue um, that uh, Ian talked about of being uh, in, brought up in Glasgow where, you know, are you Protestant? Or you Catholic, uh, or, or so on. In Liverpool, there, there was only ever one question: uh, Are you Liverpool or are you Everton? Right. Uh, and, and football is 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 the key. Um, well, uh, well sure. Are you Celtic or are you Rangers? Did translate into the same question. It it, it, it did. Um, it did. You're quite right. Um, you're quite right. And and we got a lot of our best players from Celtic, so we appreciate we appreciate we appreciate that. Um, on anti-Semitism personal uh, I mean you know I think Ian again was right I mean what they say about you when you're not there I, I, I've got no doubt there's plenty but uh, you know when I was given that calling by David Cameron back in 2015 I've not hesitated to stand up even when it's been difficult and even when it's been alone and it, uh, to stand up for for the community or for for Israel uh, and, and can continue continue to do that on the issue of the Labour Party um, I, I, my, uh, for me, the, we, we've got to take a bit of time to judge this. Uh, and I say that for a couple of reasons. I mean, I, I, I've only met Keir Starmer once, and that actually was in Borenwood Shul. Uh, if some people remember, he was there for a bar mitzvah uh, in, in, at the end of last year. Uh, and I, I talked him, uh, Sorry? He didn't get hugged, did he? <laughs> uh, no, but apparently he wanted to give the sermon. Um, right. but, uh, but he it was interesting. He, uh, he said, I'm not going to take shishi. He said, if it's not before a commission, I'm not doing it. He was no, 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 yeah. But I, I was told, I, I had to explain to him I was a Cohen, so you know, he wasn't going to be on before me. Um, but but what, what was interesting, I, sp I spoke to him then about you know, Corbyn was still in it, was just before the election last winter, and um, I talked to him a bit about uh, anti Semitism, and he, he, he was a bit of a closed shop on it. And here's my issue. My issue is this. He spent four years at the helm of the shadow cabinet trying to put Jeremy Corbyn into 10 Downing Street. Um, if he felt that strongly, and he felt that strongly about Anderson, why didn't he fight that within? Now, he may have done, but we don't know because we haven't really heard. So that's my issue. He spent four years working to get Jeremy Corbyn into 10 Downing Street, which would have been a, a total disaster, as we all know, uh, in, in so many ways. And on the sacking of Re Rebecca Long Bailey, um, that wasn't difficult for him. Right. You see, he, he was, a, you know, he, she was one of, uh, she was one of uh, Corbyn's people on the front bench. She didn't uh, say sorry, apologise for what she'd done, the retweeting or whatever, and he was able to go. So getting rid of another one of Corbyn's people uh, suited him. Now, don't get me wrong, the uh, issue of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, I mean, you know, uh, he, he was always going to be, anybody was going to be better than the previous incumbent. And we'll have to see. He certainly has started off, but here's where I think the problem may be, and we might see this actually manifest itself in the next week. And that is that he may improve their anti-Semitism record, but I wonder, and I pose the question, but I wonder whether the sacrifice might be Israel. And you've already seen Lisa Nandy come out very strongly saying there should be boycotts of settlement goods if Israel moves forward on whatever activity they're going to do this coming week. So I think that needs to be watched. They may improve on anti-Semitism, but I don't think they'll be very good on Israel. Thank you. That's very interesting to watch. Thank you. 
Now, um, we have some time for questions, and I said the laws are very graciously agreed to take questions. So if anybody has a question, please either uh, type it into the chat facility or raise your hand either again using the, um, the button in the chat facility or physically. I'll see if I can spot anybody. Okay. First one up is Barry. Okay, Barry, you can unmute yourself. Hi, good evening. Um, Stuart, Stuart you, you just alluded to, Rabbi, I think you alluded to what may happen this week um, in terms of Israeli politics and uh, annexation and so on. Um, I think the government has already sort of said there they will, would be against that move. Um, do you think there's any chance of the government sort of moderating its position and how difficult will it be for the Jewish community to defend that, um, given that itself it's quite divided on the issue? Thank you, Barry. Uh, thank you, Barry. And uh, thanks for the uh, congratulations on Liverpool. Much appreciated. I didn't want to mention that. And I thought not. Um, <laughs> look, um, I, I, I think those of us who've worked in the pro-Israel community have, have failed in some ways over the last 53 years to explain the issue of uh, Judea and Samaria, or the West Bank, whatever you want to call it. And uh, I don't want to go here into massive detail on whether it's annexation or whether it's just giving uh, Israeli um, um, sovereignty on areas of land which are disputed. Um, so it, it, there's a whole long story which we haven't quite got across. And actually, I don't think the Israeli government has got across because the word annexation, some 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 uh, international lawyers will argue it's not annexation at all. You know, this was part of the original mandate and uh, how can you annex something which you do have a right to have? So the problem is it's, it's, it's shorthand and it's easy to say it's against international uh, and we must, uh, we, we must do something. I, I think um, I'm pretty happy to say here that if we get to a position, um, I don't know how to put this, let's be very straight. If the, the British government says that they don't like it, they don't agree with it, but doesn't do anything, i.e. there will be no embargoes, arms embargoes, boycotts of Israel, uh, and so on, which I have a feeling is going to be the position of the government, they're not gonna like it. So they might say things, but they won't do anything. I think that will be a, a, a position. But of course, it's all hypothetical. We don't exactly know what Israel is going to do. And in those of people who know uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, he is a pragmatist. He'll be weighing up exactly what it is he ought to do um, and to see the price to be paid for whatever he makes the decision to do. Is it, is it too much of a price to pay to take whatever he's going to do. But the last line on all this is that, that even Arafat, as I always explain to people, knew that places like Malé, Adumim and other places would form part of Israel eventually when a peace process is done. And what I'm trying to encourage the British government to do is to use its influence with the Palestinians to tell them, you know what, sit down and talk rather than go to international fora and get everybody else to do it for you. If you sit down and talk, there will be a willingness to, to move forward. So uh, it's going to be a, a really difficult period. It will be difficult for the community and those defenders of Israel because you can't now begin to try and explain this whole international law thing. Um, uh, uh, it's shorthanded. People will say it's wrong. But, you know, I, 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 I repeat, if, it can, if the result is that there's a bit of noise but no action, I think we should uh, take it. Sure, if I could, if I can just add, I think it also depends what it is. I mean, as you said, whether it, I mean, because uh, the 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 moves by the Israeli government could could be uh, differing in scale, and, and I think the extent to which, uh, the, if any action is taken at all, but also the extent of it will uh, uh, determine some elements to response. I think the British government will be supportive, but it uses unquestionably uses up. Uh, uh, it makes it difficult for Israel's friends, and it makes it easier for Israel's enemies. And, uh, and, uh, and 
and I, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, the Labour Party does adopt uh, um, some element of uh, of uh, uh, anti-settlement uh, uh, boycott. And bear in mind, the UK government policy already on goods from settlements is that we do not support. Uh, you know, the British government, I remember as trade minister, I was very involved in this and, uh, and uh, you know, finding the right words, but uh, the British government does not uh, support or promote uh, uh, goods from settlements. So, there, you know, they, there already is a delineation. And I think these things, one thing after another makes it easier. And if we get a government one day in the future, this is uh, less pro-Israel uh, than, than the current one, at least, uh, and uh, it, will make it, it will make it more difficult. And, and one thing that has been happening over the last uh, number of years is trade between Israel and the UK has been booming. It's been particularly beneficial for Israel because it's usually been UK um, importation of Israeli technology. And you know, whereas at BT, we actually set, it helped set up an Israel-UK hub uh, which uh, and the UK government puts money in supporting a sort of joint technology hub, and that's been very good. Uh, and I think one out of seven uh, drugs prescribed in the UK is from Israel. Yeah, so there's been a, it's been a, a very successful, and I think these sort of things do some harm. I don't think uh, uh, if it's not too big, will do immediate harm, but it, it's a drip drip effect. That that is that is medicinal drugs you're talking about. Uh, that is most definitely medicinal drugs that I'm talking about. Yeah, Prescription drugs, I think, is the exact phrase we have. Indeed. Right. We also see the change in the law in Israel this week about that. Thank you, Barry. Excellent question, Barry. Thank you. Next question, please. Anybody? Okay. I have one here in the chat. Uh, it came off Facebook. It's quite a long question, so just bear with me. I'll read it here. Do you think that remote electronic voting and remote sitting even should continue once we get back to normal? No doubt many companies will shift more to remote working to some extent. So is it time to modernize parliament in both the House of Commons and Lords? Well, I, I can answer simply, yes. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, I think Ian mentioned it earlier. I think this is a positive that will, will come out and the idea of, uh, being able to vote remotely, uh, I think, works. Uh, it, it actually gives the government a bit of a problem um, um, because uh, uh, for those who understand the, the numbers in the House of Lords, the Conservative don't have a majority. Uh, Labour and Liberal come together and with some, with some cross benches. Actually, it's almost impossible for the, Conservative, uh, the, the, the government to win a vote. Uh, and of course, most things are then overturned by the commons. So that is a problem. But uh, the use of technology is clearly going, going to be the way forward. Uh, uh, and I think the idea of the, the hybrid, which we're trying to do at the moment, is, is going to be the way forward for, for certainly the House of Lords and, probably, and the House of Commons. Right. Yeah, I, I'm not so sure I agree with Stuart. I think one of the issues is this notion, I mean, Stuart mentioned while well, voting on the 17th uh, T, and I don't like to ask him, Green even, I don't like to ask him as to how much he'd studied the amendment at the time. Uh, but I think there is a certain ass assumption if you go into the Lords, you know, if you can be bothered to go in and listen to the debate, that your vote might be more uh, worthwhile. And where I do agree with Stuart is the, the when you got remote voting, uh, the uh, the chance of the government losing probably goes up. And uh, last week, I think uh, uh, every single vote I, I voted for in, uh, with the government and every single vote the government lost. I mean, it was it was sort of, I was losing so much, it felt like being a Rangers supporter. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, and I think, I think there is a question about, uh, you know, uh, people voting without uh, uh, being in the chamber at all, or at least having made the effort to go, uh, to go in maybe something that may not be a, a, a good thing. I think certain things like select committees um, and witnesses and the like would be um, perfect being done uh, remotely. I'm, I'm less convinced about some of the other things. Although I think it could be a long time before we get back to what we call normal. Uh, so it could certainly carry on for, for some time. And look, it's also tied up with the fact in the Lords in particular, the Lords, that's uh, true for the Commons as well, particularly the Lords, there are too many people uh, there. And, uh, um, and we don't have a chamber that can adequately fit people in. Uh, they, they have uh, prayers before, the, before questions in the Lords. And you have a choice of 
going into prayers which uh, aren't uh, are not mincha, um, uh, in order to be able to ask a question or uh, be like uh, the Jewish kids in the assembly where you're waiting outside and, and you don't and if you and there's a seat for you when you try and come in. So it's actually quite a difficult environment. And I think both the House of Lords and the House of Commons have got too big and we can do something about changing that rather than just saying uh, uh, we should retain the remote nature. I think we should take what was good from it. And there are some, some good things, information flow and maybe select committees and the like and, and other meetings. But I'm not convinced we should uh, be doing remote voting apart from people who are ill or uh, pregnancy or, uh, or, or for other ongoing reasons. Right. I think it's quite amazing that we've, we've been on for an hour. This is the first time we've had a, a slight disagreement between the two of you. Well, we're, we're not disagreeing because actually um, what's interesting, uh, and, and Ian is right, I mean, when we do vote, we, we, we should know a little bit what we're voting about. But Ian will no doubt uh, agree with me. But um, actually, when, when we are in the chamber and, and a division is called, the vast, vast majority of people who will vote are, are coming in from the, the bars or the meet other meetings or other things rather than being in the chamber yeah. and so on. So actually, I think that the, the nature of that perhaps needs to, needs to be looked at. One of the things about the House of Lords is that it, it's, it's the tradition and uh, it goes back a, a long way. And uh, I, I, uh, I think because of COVID and because of where we've now broken the back, i.e. we've done some voting online, and I think it now will be easier because, you know, we've, I'd say, broken the back of this to, to make certain changes, which I think will, will enhance our, uh, our reputation, actually. Right, thank you. I mean, maybe also a lesson there for you, Lord Pollock, is um, think more carefully who you play golf with in future. <laughs> we, we, much with you. we yeah. have a couple more questions here if you don't mind carrying on uh, in the chat facility here what, what alternatives I just read this one I'm just reading it as I'm seeing it here what alternatives to the horror can you imagine might replace traditional simica revelry if distance remains a normal caution for a lot of people I'd like to first say uh, take no responsibility for these questions can, can, sorry can you repeat the question what alternatives to the horror can, am I saying it right? So the horror, you, that, can you imagine might replace... H-O-R-A H -O -R -A or H-O-R-R-O? I think it's H-O-R-A, I am. Yeah, yeah, as in the, the horror, you know, as in the... <laughs> oh, sorry, dog, sorry. Not O-R. <laughs> yes, not... not um, what else is this? <laughs> Maybe we'll move on from that one. Um, do you think there'll be any traditional... Uh, there'll be a replacement for the traditional way that we uh, Simicas celebrate? Or, that not really government policy. <laughs> I think a question for the rabbi. Yeah, absolutely. Over to you, rabbi. <laughs> well, we're, we're very clear, you know, that we are going to be follow, following government guidelines to the letter. So whatever the government tell us on that. If, if they lead, we'll follow. Okay, I think we'll move on. Another question. Has religion ever got in the way of your political career, e.g. not working on Shabbat? Sorry, can you say that again? Again, again. Has, religion, just... has religion ever got in the way of your political career? Uh, not me, not at all. No, no. And I, I think, uh, I think, strangely enough, um, I find non-Jewish people tend to be more respectful of uh, when you say it's a uh, uh, yontiv or something, you can't go in or whatever, or uh, or you need to be home. You, you, you got Friday night uh, dinner. Fair enough, they're more respectful, I find, than, uh, than, than sometimes some other Jewish people are. So I found it um, uh, uh, never a problem. Uh, I have a question here for Lord Pollock. Um, when's your next trip? It sounds such fun. Can I come? Um, well, they're, they're not all, uh, not all, uh, well, I mean, again, that's down to the government. When we can next fly to Israel, we will right. go. Right. Yeah, it's also down to the Israeli government as well as to uh, when you can fly and not and not uh, be uh, 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 so both, both governments on both sides. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have a question? I'm just looking through all the faces here, I can see. Okay, I have another one here. Another question I have here is. Um, many, pe many people are sceptical and mistrusting of politicians and politics. Do you think that they are justified? 
Well, I think you know, having come from over from from business, I mean, one of the things I found was that uh, for the very most part, uh, politicians on both sides, although there are some recent ones that have been the exception, but certainly, I think up to the period of sort of 2015, politicians on both sides genuinely went to politics because they wanted to improve things, they wanted to make the UK better. Um, they had different ways of going down around it and their definition was, di was different, but they want to help people. And one of the things is, um, I think people are often surprised when they actually talk and realize that um, whether it be a conservative politician has a huge passion for the NHS or for, for education, and they might not have assumed that, or, or, or Labour Party really wants to support business, that, that people do go into the right motivation. The very most part, um, particularly at a ministerial level, they could earn more and you know, have an easier life. And it's a very tough life being a minister. It is, it is all consuming. Um, uh, and uh, so I think for the most part, um, uh, people in politics for the right reason. I do think, however, both the, uh, um, the splintering of, uh, you know, when people say I could never have a Tory as a friend is exactly the sort of uh, thing that is wrong in politics, where, uh, you, know, you know, the ability to respect someone else's uh, view, even if you disagree with them, respect them as human being, is something we are starting to lose in some elements, and that's one problem. I think things like the Spencer scandal did not help any, uh, anyone at all. But the U one of the things in the UK, we're very lucky to have a really a relatively in, uh, uncorrupt uh, government. When you talk, go around the world, the, you know, the compare and contrast, they are amazed at the things that UK politicians resign for over, a bit less recently, but they are amazed uh, at the, uh, uh, I, I remember there was a Home Secretary who, who helped his nanny get further up the list uh, for a visa, and he resigned. And I remember speaking to a French colleague at the time who said, you know, why would you resign over it? And I think it shows the UK for the most part is pretty good. We've got a very, very aggressive press. I think keeps us good, even if it goes over the top. But we are losing some of the things that make us, I think, uh, 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 about politicians, both in the way they act sometimes and, uh, uh, and their action to each other that has lost respect. And I think that's a, that's a problem. And also, I think, because there's too many politicians increasingly who haven't done anything else. And you know, having achieved something else in life, I think it will add far more to how you act, and also will give people far more respect. Thank you. I think if you if you got um, a room full of a uh, hundred lawyers, a hundred anything, you might find that there'll be a couple of bad apples, um, and there may be that in politicians as well. Uh, but I think the very the vast majority of people. Uh, certainly in the House of Commons and, and the House of Lords, of course, are, are in it to, as, uh, to make things better, to pick up the areas that you are interested in if you're in the Lords or, you know, in, when you're in the House of Commons, you, you're doing your bidding for, for your constituents, whether they voted for you or they didn't. The vast majority are, are absolutely um, good, well-meaning and, and so forth. Um, where does problems and there are always problems in society I mean and then you link that with the sort of press the gotcha type of press who want to trip you up at every moment because you didn't know this or you didn't get it. and you see so much of that for uh, uh, Ian saw that when he was a minister and ministers all the time if you don't know every detail of everything you know we're going to catch you out on it which I think is just just ridiculous and sometimes you know we have the the best of the press and the worst of the press at the same time so i think you know we are uh, as a group of individuals of, of politicians they are like anybody else in society but because they're always in the public domain the, the ones that do things wrong that brings the sort of whole whole thing into disrepute and then the press makes a, a major story uh, and you've only got to follow some of the stories that are going that have been going in the last few weeks uh, even a couple of weeks and um, most of it is just just um, ridiculous um, but that, 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 that's the life uh, that's the life we lead but I you know the vast majority are decent hard-working good people thank you I think we've, got, we've got time for two final questions just quickly maybe a quick answer for this one we've gone we've gone for over an hour without having to mention the, the, the B word um, 
our minds have been taken off Brexit by the coronavirus. Um, in your opinion, just a very, very quick answer, if you could. Um, do you think that after the pandemic is cleared, really, that um, Brexit will be back on track, or what's, what's the future have in store for us? Uh, I think it has taken our mind off it, but it's going to be pretty difficult. Um, yeah, you can, uh, yeah, we've got uh, not a lot of time to do trade deals, and you can do a good trade deal, you can do a comprehensive trade deal, or you can do a quick trade deal, and you just can't do all three. And I think, uh, uh, I think it will harm British uh, exports, um, uh, because the EU won't play, whether the EU's being fair or not being fair, it, they won't play nice. Uh, and they'll dig their heels in, as will the Americans, having negotiated trade deals with Americans, and, and on the same side as the EU, both of them will dig their heels in. And I think um, that's going to be harmful for us. Um, uh, but we're on that path, and now the path, I think, for all of us has to be to try and help make the best of it, and to remember that the UK, for example, is the second largest exporter of services, and that's probably actually more important than uh, uh, than agriculture or, or, or trade. It's, it's, it's going to be really difficult, and there's going to be cliff edge, because I think the only way we can get a decent deal will be by looking over the edge of a cliff. The trouble is occasionally one falls over when one looks over the edge of a cliff. Right. Right. Uh, I, I don't disagree with, with, with any of that, uh, although I think because of the pandemic, I, I think we, there is a greater chance of leaving without a deal uh, for a lot of the reasons that Ian said uh, than there the, the was or there would have been had there been no pandemic. But, you know, um, I'm, not, I'm not privy to the, the conversations, but one, uh, one hopes the deal can be done. Um, and you can understand a little bit of the EU digging their heels in as, as Ian called it because you know we we've burst their balloon we've left the we've left the party we've left the uh, the organization and you know why should we give preferential deals because they've left and there are elements of that I would say this though if 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 Britain was able to negotiate directly with other governments in the EU um, and this is why I think there, there is a bit of hope because I think um, you know, if there was a direct conversation with uh, with Merkel, for instance, in Germany and others, I think deals could and would be done because in the end, you know, why why cut off your nose to spite your face? So the problem, one of the problems is that that, that, that often the negotiations are dealing with, uh, are being dealt, dealt with from the EU side by bureaucrats who it is their whole life. So, sorry, Stuart, I'm going to disagree with you on that. I've sat are. around many European Council meetings. Unfortunately, it is, the, it is the ministers from the individual countries who make their life difficult with negotiating mandate for the bureaucrats. Um, and actually, the commissioner tends to be the... Uh, unfortunately, you can never have a conversation about trade without the French complaining about the agriculture. The, uh, uh, the, you know, the, 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 there, there will be a real digging in, uh, and we shouldn't. Uh, the, we've unfortunately thought the Germans would come to our rescue too often in the past. I think it's going to be, uh, it's going to be tough, and we shouldn't assume it's the EU. We always used to blame the EU because it suits us, even when it was our government. No, no, I accept that, but I do think that the that, that the Germans and others won't, won't want to. A, a no deal situation because it will affect their economy too yeah so i think you know i think there'll be a meeting of mind somewhere let's see okay thank you that's interesting to look at and the final question this evening is that we know sadly the jewish community has been disproportionately affected by the coronavirus pandemic um how do we how do you account for the disproportionate number of jews in politics and in business um <laughs> there, there is clearly, uh, I mean, I think of the House of Lords, I mean, sure, you know, may know them better than me, but about 70, about, uh, 70 out, of, out, of, just out of 800 Lords are, uh, are, are, are of the faith. We're about Sorry? 10%. About yeah, 10%. About, about that sort of number. Um, look, I think, uh, I think it goes to how we're, how a whole range of factors about how we're brought up and, uh, expectation and one of the things I've noticed I go around a lot of schools um, doing present in, in sort of uh, disadvantaged schools and and so many of the immigrant communities they they describe what um, you know what they want to do is they, by talking about their parents and their parents represent the floor of what they want to do you know my father ran a shop therefore I I'm going to go to university and I think 
you can see the same thing being repeated. The Indian community is very similar. Uh, I mean, look at the, you know, just look at America, the number of uh, companies are headed now by Indian chief executives, and you see it increasingly in, in, in politics. In fact, as the Indian government might point out, how many of uh, the cabinet is uh, of uh, Indian origin. So I think you see it in some of the immigrant communities, and I think it's about family, it's about education, and it's about expectation. Um, uh, you know, one of the last things my father said to me uh, uh, um, uh, was, uh, Ian, I don't understand you're intelligent enough to be a doctor. Uh, so it is, uh, it's a little bit about the expectations that are set by your parents. All right. Thank you, that's present date. Look, it is, it's, uh, it's the focus that we as a community have had on education and, and getting on. Uh, wherever we are, the, our history has shown that, uh, you know, we, we need to get on and have trades and things that can sadly be moved. You know, if you can be a doctor in one place, you can be a doctor somewhere else, or if you're importing something, you can go and do it somewhere else. I mean, these things are um, throughout Jewish history have been, and certainly the last hundred years has been, uh, it's about making the most of your, of your situation. And if it means getting involved in, in, in the political field and the business field, this is exactly what we've done. And, and Ian's right, the, you know, the, you, you, you look at the, the Indian community and other communities who are, are falling off, exactly that. And uh, I don't think it's a, um, I don't think it's um, a coincidence that there are so many members of say the House of Lords who, who are Jewish. I don't want you to think that all, all 80 of them uh, stand up for, for Israel and Jewish issues on, on, on a regular basis. There's a few of us, uh, two of them are on, 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 are, are on tonight. Um, it's not so simple and, uh, you know, my job over the years has been to try and encourage non-Jewish supporters. So, you know, we're, we're in the House of Lords these days when you've got um, uh, John Mann um, standing up and fighting anti-Semitism and sitting next to, to Ian and I is uh, Lord Pickles, Eric Pickles, who stands up for our community and, and, and so on. Uh, this is the stuff that um, we, are, we concentrate on. But uh, as, a, as a community, it's about getting on and making sure that we are, you know, able to, to, to live in, in society, be part of society, integrate with society, without assimilating, which is, uh, you know, back to your job, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Paula. That's a very, very kind of you. Uh, I think this has, been a fanta this has been a fascinating conversation, and thank you to everyone who's participated, particularly Lord Pollock and Lord Livingston. Thank you for your time and for answering all of the questions that have been put to you. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have, and I'm sure everybody watching has. On behalf of us all, I thank you. Just before we wrap up for this evening, I just want to uh, share with you um, the next event we're doing online is this Wednesday evening on the 1st of July at 8.30, Relationships Surviving and Thriving. I'll be in conversation with Tova Hirsch, who is a qualified person-centered psychodynamic counselor to help us uh, also deal with lockdown and surviving and thriving relationships post-lockdown. So please join me once again for live on Facebook and on Zoom for that. But once again, this evening, I thank you, Lord Pollock and Lord Livingston, for your time and for answering our questions and for everyone for joining us please keep well stay safe stay alert and uh, <laughs> we'll see you back in school at some point when the government allows us thank you and good night thank you thank you bye 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 thanks you, Robert.